Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Terry Pipe. I am Arizona State University's Chief Wellbeing Officer and the founding director of our Center for Mindfulness, Compassion and Resilience. And I'm joined today by our team members, Nika Gwechi, Tiara Cash, Hannah Layton and Jackie Spear. Uh, our, our theme for today is about uh, our community. And our community is very large and growing larger every day, even though we can't be physically with each other. Um, we'll have some ground rules later, but I want to get started right away uh, with a shout out message to my, my nursing leader colleagues, Kate Fitzpatrick and Jeff Doucette. They are nurse leaders at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I had the opportunity to talk with them last night and what they're facing is incredible. The challenges of keeping their patients and their nursing staff and their physicians safe and functioning under conditions that no one has ever imagined before. And so they asked if we could come up with a very short um, meditation or message to go out to the nurses. So that's what we'll do today. So this will be very brief. And this goes from our team to your teams, uh, Jeff and Kate, uh, with such heartfelt uh, compassion and nothing short of awe for what you're doing. So with gratitude. So if you'd like to, you can bring your eyes to close, but that's not necessary. Please just listen to my voice. Uh, if you're in a place where you're busy, that's fine. Just listen to the words. If you can and it feels right to you, you can take a deeper breath. If breathing isn't comforting to you right now, which is understandable, maybe bring your attention into your feet. Sometimes when we're scared or uncertain or our mind is moving so fast, it's really helpful to bring our attention into our feet because our feet don't normally feel anxious and scared. So however it happens for you to be best, bring your attention into your being and touch into that part of yourself that is your center. Maybe it's the area around your heart, the essence of you. And please keep that part of you open enough. Right now, it might be a feeling really tempting to, to close down and to get a callus on that part, but please keep it open enough to receive the love that is here for you. You have so many people across the country, across the world, rooting for you, extending love and compassion and respect your way. So with your heart being open, ready to receive, you've been giving and giving and you will be called on to continue giving. Please also allow love to come in. Allow yourself to receive the care and concern that is here for you. And with just a brief message, remember always that you can heal the moment. You may not be able to heal the patient. You may not be able to solve the problem. You may not be able to prevent the death, but you will always be able to heal the moment. So please know that that ability goes with you always. You know how to do that. You have the skills and the abilities and you know how to do that, not only for your patients and your colleagues, but for yourselves. So heal the moment. So now maybe taking a deeper breath and remembering that even while some things are scarce, we're focused on what we don't have right now, please know deeply that love and compassion and imagination are never ever limited. There is no scarcity of love and compassion. There is only abundance. So tapping into that, tapping into that strength and know that there are so many hundreds and thousands, millions of people uh, watching and supporting you and really wishing you well. So thank you. And please know uh, that, that we're with you every step. And if there's anything else that we can do, we stand at the ready. So perhaps bringing your eyes to open, we salute your courage and we just wish you the very best. Thank you. So that um, 
that is just a very heartfelt message and a really clear reminder of why we're here together today. So we have, we're all being asked to physically distance from each other, but we've never ever needed each other more. The connections one with another are so important right now. So that's actually why we designed these um, YouTube videos. They go out to you every day for about an hour. And if, if you can't stay on the whole time, not to worry at all, you can access these uh, later by just visiting our website, uh, mindful, asumindfulness.edu, and uh, they'll be available to you. So the, the only ground rules really are to let yourself uh, experience these sessions as fully as you can, decrease any distractions that you can uh, while you're here with us. And um, if you're joining us live, we'd love to hear from you. And so there's a chat function that you can use. You can just write us your messages, your questions, anything that you would like us to pay attention to. Um, we're also, uh, we have the themes through next week and we just plan to keep doing this for as long as it's necessary. And so if you have topics that you would like us to consider, please uh, drop us a line and let us know too. So we've gathered up some questions and, um, and thoughts over the week. And so I'll ask Jackie if she would read those and then anyone on the team uh, that, that feels that they have the, a great response, we won't say the right answer because the answers are always evolving as we go. But if you have a great response, just jump in. All right, Jackie. Okay, thank you. Okay, so our first question, I think I'm going to direct this to all of you, but Tira, um, especially, um, it says, I am undergrad and plan to move on to my grad program right away after I graduate. I've been feeling really stuck trying to decide the direction of my career and honestly feeling stuck in my personal life too. I feel like I can't move forward and I keep looking backward. I have so much anxiety over making the wrong decision. This is such a big deal. Each option could be great for me, but the unknown is killing me. If I go down the wrong road, I keep envisioning being in the wrong career and not doing what I'm meant to be doing. I made the mistake of not making a decision in high school and a really good opportunity passed me by. I have huge regrets about it. How can I get clear and centered about what I want to do and letting go of that mistake that is haunting me so I'm not feeling so stuck? Thanks. Ooh, I want to hold that with you because I, um, I feel that <laughs> I, I, you know, no, no two situations are the same, but I can understand in a lot of ways how um, that could feel because I was in a very similar situation and, and it is tough, right? Like considering making the wrong decision, um, is tough and it's something that we hold on to. And actually my sister and I have been having a lot of conversations around this. So the first thing I would like suggest you doing is just going back to the conversation that we had last week, which is sitting with the fact that you've acknowledged that a choice needs to be made. And that's like, hurrah, right? <laughs> Very proud of you for acknowledging the fact that you need that, that the choice is, it's time for that choice to be made. Um, and then just, just sitting with, with that, with the choice. What does it look like? How does it show up in your body? What does it feel like? What emotions are around it? Acknowledge those. And if you can put those to the side and separate those feelings and the way that it shows up in your body, um, separate that from the actual choice itself, you might be able to see the choice as different than the story your body's telling you around it. So that's the other piece of it. But also to, to know and this is something that, you know, my parents have, have really tried to instill in me that I don't think any choice is a wrong choice, right? Every choice that we make is really a choice that we, in some ways, are supposed to make. And so it's just about holding the data and, and holding the knowledge as much as you, as much as you can, um, doing your pros and cons list, and then making a choice based off how you're feeling about it. Right, like, okay, these are the things structurally that, that sound right for the choice. This is how I really feel about this choice versus this choice. And then just trusting yourself to make a decision. And that decision will be the right one for you because you're making it, 
right? And whatever is supposed to come from that decision is supposed to come. And my hope is that when you make that decision um, later on in life, it'll, it'll show that it was right for whatever is supposed to come after that as well. Um, holding on to, to, to mistakes or choices, we can see them as lessons that helps too. Um, I had a choice that, that I made that I held on to for a really long time. And I had to learn that that was traumatic for me, right? And, and that I had to, again, disassociate the story from the choice itself. So once I was like, you know what? I'm not that decision. <laughs> I'm a person who made that decision and I'm allowed to, to learn lessons in life and that's okay. Once I, I made that, that distinction, then it was like, okay, the next choice is not gonna be a mistake for me. It's just gonna be a choice and I'm gonna learn from it, whatever it's supposed to be. And it'll be the right choice because it is a choice. So those are, um, it's a lot, but that's, that's my, my advice to you. Um, and to go back and, and visit that, the clearing um, meditation session that we had, the midday mindfulness session and see if that works for you at all too. I would like to say something about this if I can. Um, so yes, I would love to hold space for that. Um, kind of, Hannah, you gotta speak up. I would love to hold space for that kind of fear of uncertainty. I think that that's something that's really relevant in so many lives and so many aspects right now. Um, I was just reading a great passage by Pima Kodron. Kodron, is that how you say it? I hope so. Um, but it says, can you think of groundlessness and openness of insecurity as a chance that we're given over and over again to choose a fresh alternative? Things happen to us all the time that open up space. This spaciousness in wide open, unbiased, unprejudiced space is inexpressible and fundamentally good and sound. It is like the sky. Whenever you're in a hot spot or feeling uncomfortable, whenever you're caught up and don't know what to do, you can find some place um, where you can go and look at the sky and experience some freshness, free of hope, fear, free of bias and prejudice, just completely open. And this is accessible to all of us all the time. Space permeates everything, every moment of our lives. So is there something that you can do um, to kind of get out of this moment of fear and, and let the spaciousness fill you up for a little? Something I did when I was going through um, the similar um, unsurety of what to do after my undergrad, um, I put all of my options in a hat. I wrote down all of my options and I would pick one out and sit with it and see how it felt in my body. And, and I would kind of go through them. And one eventually felt really right. It felt the best of all of them. Um, so playing little games of chance like that and seeing your initial reaction might help too. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'll, I'll chime in. I love those answers, uh, Tiara and Hannah. Those are really beautiful. I love the poem that you just read. Um, so we really never know what the right decision is until we make it, right? We're, we're, we make decisions based on the information that we have available to us at the time that we have it available. And we really never know if it's the right one until it happens, until we make it. But I've also learned that as long as you're alive, as long as you're breathing, there are very few things that you cannot fix. So if you don't make the right decision and you realize that it's not the right decision, there are ways to alter that and to fix it and to make a decision from there. I'm wondering if it might be nice for us to do just a, a very brief uh, mindfulness session on, um, I mean, like now, not another mindfulness session, but right now, <laughs> a self-compassion exercise. Because when I, I heard that letter and I heard the regret about the choice that was made in the past, I know sometimes when I look in the past and I've, I've made choices or I've made mistakes, um, opportunities to learn, <laughs> in other words, as Tira said, great reframing. Um, you know, there's a little zing to it. There's a little uh, self-blame or there's a little, uh, I don't know, self-recrimination. So it's never too late to go back and repair that. 
And so maybe it would be a nice chance for us now to just join in that because my guess is that all of us have something that we could go back and think about. It's sort of the human nature that we've made, you know, decisions that were, you know, now we can see the lesson in them, but at the time they really hurt. So let's go ahead and bring ourselves to a, a nice upright posture, or if you're lying down, that's just fine. Bring some strength and uprightness to your spine and some depth to your breath, letting your breath find you. And then maybe closing your eyes. And here we'll bring the focus to the area around the heart. So really getting familiar with what that feels like in your chest, maybe a, an openness, a spaciousness, maybe it's feeling heavy, whatever is in there today is just fine. And then in your mind's eye, in your imagination, remembering a time when you made a life choice, a big one, a small one, after a time of feeling stuck and uncertain. And maybe you feel like it was not in your best interest now, or it was a mistake. You have a little regret about it. So just getting that decision in your mind. And then seeing how it feels in your body to feel regretful about it. This often comes up in tightness in your jaw or a clenching in your stomach. Maybe your heart does feel heavy with it. Or maybe nothing. Maybe you've really moved on and there's really nothing. Whatever is there is there and that's just fine. But seeing if you can imagine yourself back then, if it was a day ago, a month ago, a year ago, years ago, and seeing yourself making that decision and understanding that you were just doing the best that you could with the information that you had. Your intentions were likely spot on. You were probably intending to do well by yourself and others. You were probably being guided by your values. And so it's not a bad idea to bring kindness and compassion to that past self. Darling, I know that you tried your best. I can see that you were really choosing based on what you knew at the time. And after all, I have learned from that choice. I've learned so much. I've learned to let go and let things unfold a bit. See what I can learn to become better. So really with sincerity, extending yourself, your, your self of the past and yourself of the present, a great gentle compassion, a great gesture and words, words of care and concern and release, made the decision, life has unfolded, you've learned, and you're here now. You're here now, wiser, perhaps more compassionate and caring for others as well as yourself. And know too that the decisions of today and of the future, you'll bring your best self to, you'll you'll bring your best intention to just trust, have trust, have trust. So now bringing some small movements into your fingers and toes and reopening your eyes. Thank you, thanks for that practice. Should we move on to the next question, Jackie? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> that was really beautiful and that was just much needed, I think. So thank you for that. Um, I have the next question. Um, it says, 
My granddaughter has been complaining about being lonely and depressed. I noticed every time I see her, she is on her phone and barely speaks to anyone in the room. She is never present, and I think a train could go through the room and she wouldn't notice. How can I help? We have a comment down here, just, um, just referring back real quick about the previous question. Beth said, when I was an elementary, ML, sorry, elementary school teacher, my mantra to the students was, mistakes are our friends, they teach us lessons. That's so true. Um, Tiara, love that Beth, my parents used to tell me a similar thing, thank you for sharing. And we got some more thank yous for the meditation and um, incredibly touching tears running down my face. Thank you. Well, since we're all jumping in, I'll give a start and then everybody else can chime in. So this is so, oh my goodness, I think we can all just envision that. And the fact that a train could go through the room, I think we've all also been there. So it feels kind of good to uh, have a light touch and, and laugh uh, about that image. So good news is that focus is happening. You know, the, the focus is there. It just might not be <laughs> the thing that, or the things, the environment that uh, you might you might rather have the focus be on. Um, I don't know, That's a, it's a really tricky situation. I'm wondering, Jackie, would you mind reading just the first part again so that we can see um, just maybe read again, that will help. Sure. My granddaughter has been complaining about being lonely and depressed. I notice every time I see her, she is on her phone and barely speaks to anyone in the room. She is never present. And I think a train could go through the room and she wouldn't notice. How can I help? So I think, um, you know, the, the key to loneliness that we, we talked about this, um, I believe it was the first week. So we also, if, if you'd like, you can go back and, and watch and see some of the, the documents that we posted on the website for loneliness. But just to sort of recap, loneliness is absolutely universal. And so maybe, you know, opening, opening a conversation about times that you felt lonely or, you know, just, an open-ended question of I'm wondering if you're feeling lonely. Um, and sometimes that will get the conversation started. And that loneliness is like physical pain. You know, it affects our body, our brain, like physical pain does. It's a signal that help is needed. So it's really beautiful that you're picking up that, you know, help is needed. Unfortunately, it also, with loneliness and depression both, it sort of depletes our energy. And so with, with both of those experiences, it's very hard to do what is needed and that is reach out of oneself um, to ask for help or to interact with others. And so she's really lucky to have you that, that you're there for her and to be present with her. And if a, if a conversation isn't quite available yet because maybe she just doesn't feel like talking, Sometimes just being in the same space is to show her that you're present with her and that you accept her just as she is. It can go a really long way. Um, you know, sometimes physical touch is tricky in these cases. Sometimes, um, you know, a gesture of touch and, uh, you know, a hand on an arm or on your shoulder. Sometimes it can be very comforting, but sometimes people don't respond positively at all. So you know her pretty well. I would be guided by you know your, your past, but um, go slowly with physical touch. It could be that she's really craving that and, and would welcome it. Hard to say, everybody is a little bit different. Um, I also think that resources for depression and suicide are really important. So making sure that you have access to, that you've looked at your local resources for mental health services and for suicide prevention, very, very important, just so that you're ready to have conversations and perhaps to make referrals if, if that seems appropriate. So I'd really like to hear from from others, what your ideas might be. I think that this is, 
is such a prevalent situation, but it doesn't take that doesn't take away the impact, the fact that it has impact on every single person that experiences it. Yeah, and I've also found that, you know, being on the phone constantly, the more I'm on my phone, the lonelier and less connected I feel. Um, and it's kind of a paradox because you think that you're connected and you think that you're, um, you know, sharing information, but I don't know, for some reason, it just makes me feel even less connected and even more isolated. Um, something to also do, like Terry was saying, is to engage in activities together, like cooking or walking or, you know, something that you can do together, but you don't necessarily need to talk. Um, going for a walk, even watching a movie could be uh, bonding without having to have any kind of deep conversations. Um, maybe a technology free hour or so uh, throughout the day would also be beneficial. I'd also just, oh, sorry, Hannah. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm just gonna say that, you know, I had really tough years as a teenager. I was one of those teenagers that like <laughs> was emotional and cry and be upset all the time. Um, sorry, mom. So, you know, what helped me was just to know that I had someone there, like period. Like just my mom, you know, whenever she could, if she could come in the room and be like, I'm here for you if you need me, walk back out that was enough to um, give me some comfort in those times. So, you know, unfortunately, when we are in those teenage years and chemicals are moving around and we're learning how to be um, many adults, uh, there's not a lot that someone else can do or say to change the situations that are happening in our own bodies. But just to know that someone's there might even be the game changer um, for her. So hope that helps. First, I would like to say it's so beautiful that you have so much care and compassion in your heart to reach out and um, be proactive about finding, asking about solutions and asking about what to do. Um, I think that her telling you that she feels these ways means that she trusts you and that you do have an access point with her. She trusts you and, and lets you in enough um, because that is a hard thing to say out loud, especially when you are feeling that. Um, but I think you already hold the appropriate space if she can trust you with that information. Um, and I think that when she says, when she mentions these things, um, it, for everybody, it's so different. There's no one answer. Um, so maybe asking her specifically what you can do, how how you can help, and and what kind of space she needs, um, and kind of giving her that power and that agency to tell you what she needs herself, or to so that she starts even thinking about, you know, she does have power and she she can come up with solutions, and it it would be nice to prompt. Um, I think things that just you can do to help with the loneliness, um, maybe write her a letter of all the reasons she matters to you or all of your favorite interactions that you've had with her. Maybe have other family members, if she's close to other people, do the same and then kind of just gift her with these so that she doesn't have to talk about it, but she knows that she feel she's supported and matters in these contexts. But I think that you're doing wonderful and you already have some trust um, built. So thank you for reaching out and for caring. That's awesome. Thank you, everybody. Um, I agree with everything you guys have said. And I, I have found that when um, it, conversations are difficult to start, or for some reason, the connection is, is stunted, or um, it's, I, when Nika said to try cooking or try doing something together, I think often if you put yourself in a novel situation, it takes you out of that like what you're doing every day and it kind of opens up that space to be able to feel comfortable to talk and um, maybe bring some freshness to the situation and sometimes I find it easier to talk 
about my feelings to someone when when we're busy doing something you know say we're like playing monopoly or you know or cooking like nika said because you're you're busy doing something and you're using your hands and you're kind of busying yourself and you might feel a little bit less like uncomfortable about talking so um thank you ladies and thank you for that question i think that's going to be helpful for a lot of people Okay, um, the next question that came in is, I work for Kanhai, a uh, shout out to Kanhai. I smiled when I read the Dean's subject line of a recent update email. It said, try to resist the call of the fridge. It was so relatable for me. I don't recall thinking this much about reaching for food throughout the day while I was working in the office. Any tips on why and how can I shift out of this sudden constant thinking about food? Any thoughts, ladies? Well, that is a great question. And I'm sure that this is not the only person that is struggling with this. <laughs> um, so boredom, of course, plays a huge role in this. If you're just sitting at home all day with not a whole lot to do, the call of the fridge or the pantry is that much more tempting. <laughs> But it's also, I think, about control. You know, there are so many things here in this current climate that we can't control, that we can't, you know, process even. But we can control what we consume. And so maybe that is part of the reason that the call of uh, the pantry and the fridge is, is that much more alluring these days. I think it's kind of to tag along with that. I think that with the uncertainty, there is anxiety that that happens. And so in, in this, uh, you know, very deep need for comfort and food can be a comfort. Um, and so I think that that cycle is pretty uh, interesting. And it's a time too when um, food, you know, we've never really, um, coupled mindfulness with food scarcity before, but I mean, as a team, we haven't talked about this, but uh, in today's reality, you know, when we go to grocery stores and there are empty shelves, it just gives us this sense of, of profound scarcity and that builds on the anxiety. And I think sometimes that then translates into behaviors of comfort. And even as ironic as it sounds that you might eat more when there's less to eat <laughs> or, or there's thought notions that there's less to eat. Uh, I think that, that's, that there might be something to that. And I, I think that to the boredom idea is absolutely spot on. I also think that sometimes it's procrastination. You know, eating can be a way to procrastinate from doing the next thing that you have to do. And also loneliness. Um, you know, we're doing a lot of our work in isolation these days and not having the comfort of our colleagues. I mean, I love that I get to see my team every day. Um, I miss them so much. I miss being in their physical space, but, um, you know, that, that's also just the loneliness factor, I think, is, is driving some of the comfort seeking of, of eating. Um, I don't know, what, it, what do others think? I play devil's advocate a lot. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna always be that person that's probably like completely separate in, <laughs> in my answer. This is true. Yeah, I, you know, it gives us way different, you know, answers and, and completely different spectrums. Um, you know, I also think, so my eating habits haven't changed very often, but that's because I'm a grazer. So I eat all day long anyway. When I'm at work, I eat all the time. When I'm <laughs> not at work, I eat all the time. So I find myself going to the fridge as much as I would now. Um, but the difference is, is, you know, now I have access to um, potato chips and different things where at work, I would bring fruit with me or so that's the first thing is that it's, it might not be about how much you're eating, but what you're eating, right? So can we bring some uh, mindfulness and be mindful about what you're grabbing? Because it might be okay for you, to, you might be a grazer in real life and you just found this out, right? Now you're, you're noticing that your body's pattern is to want to eat small meals six times a day. 
that might not be a bad thing, but what are you grabbing? What are you going to eat? Um, and that, so that was my playing devil's advocate is like, it might be a good thing that you're eating six times a day, but how much are you eating and what are you grabbing? Um, so listen to your body, listen to what it kind of wants. And if you're hungry, then is it time to eat? And what, what will satiate you? Uh, more than likely it's something that, um, you know, could be healthy for you, so. Um, well, also, oh, go ahead, Anna, sorry. Just to piggyback off of what Tiara said, um, kind of getting in tune with what your body is telling you and what kind of hunger you are experiencing. So we actually have a video on our center website under um, videos where Dara James talks about um, the nine different types of hunger. And this might be really useful because we experience hunger on a lot of different levels. Um, sometimes we see food and that makes us hungry. Sometimes we have cellular hunger, which is kind of what Tara was talking about, where our body needs to be nourished. Um, so maybe watch that and, and see where your mind is relating to when you go to reach the food. Yeah. And just as a note, Hannah is also starring in that video. So um, I'm cool. referring to the one underneath where it's just Dara. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't watch mine. Thank you very much. So Hannah, I was going to say exactly the same thing without the pointing people away from your video. So we do have a few resources that I think that you'll, you'll find really helpful on our website. Um, and you do get to see a cameo by Hannah, which is fantastic. Yes, it is fantastic. In fact, I think that we should all go and watch it when we're done. <laughs> um, I really appreciate that question because I, since I've been working from home, I've been struggling with that myself. And I just find that I, I just feel a little bit, you know, out of my schedule. And even though I'm home and normally I'm comfortable here, I'm not normally home during the day. Um, and I just, just feel a little bit out of sorts. And uh, I do find myself asking, why am I going to reach for food? Am I actually hungry? So maybe just asking yourself, am I actually hungry right now? And um, questioning, you know why you're there if you if you are hungry then by all means eat but if you find yourself reaching for food and you're like i am not hungry at all then maybe go take a walk um just find something to you know distract yourself for a few minutes um, or drink water that helps me to drink water and that seems to kind of help get past that because um, sometimes you're dehydrated when you think you're hungry so Thank you for that, ladies. Okay. Okay. So my, my college student mentioned he is having a hard time staying motivated with this online style of learning. Can you talk more about procrastination and how to stay motivated? I know this is a really out of the norm situation for everyone. I can certainly relate to that. I did online classes and it is a definitely a different style of learning because you don't have that, you know, professor, student um, interaction as much. And a lot of times you have to stay self-motivated or you, um, you know, you don't have somebody there to kind of keep you going. So I can relate with that. And I think we will be doing a second, we did a, a session on procrastination, but I think that we'll be doing a second session because there was so much uh, positive reaction to it, which tells us that it's, you know, it's not just me, it's not just you, it's kind of, uh, it's prevalent right now. So I think in terms of motivation for students, um, maybe asking or, um, you know, just having a, a dialogue about, you know, what, what was their motive before? You know, where did they find their motivation before this all happened? Um, recognizing that it's a, it is a very different learning environment to be online. Um, and, and so tapping back into why does the student want to be in school? What are they, they studying that is interesting and, and purpose-driven in their life? So that their motives are attached to a deeper thing than this one class, I, you know, I think that's, at least for, 
for me and in my life, that's often helpful if I can just stop and remember, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I here? And sometimes that question, you know, I, I can remember asking myself that during a certain semester when I was a student. Every day, I think I ask myself, why am I doing this? But there was an answer, uh, but I had to ask and answer the question for myself. Nobody else can kind of answer that. And then as um, this sounds kind of simple, but I think having a reward system, you know, having a schedule and, and kind of sticking to it and then carrot rather than stick. So really providing a, a reward after you've attended class or after you've done that homework, you know, certainly we want to have the reward be internally based. Intrinsic motivation is so much stronger and long lasting than extrinsic rewards, external rewards. But, you know, it never hurts to have a reinforcement. So even if the reward is something like being able to go out for a walk or uh, being able to play with the dog, it was something, uh, being able to read a book some for pleasure, something that is fun for that person to do that really um, can show that they've accomplished what they set out to do and now they get a reward, but not, not choosing a reward that's so far out, like not one that happens three weeks from now, but something that can happen today. So that the rewards are, are daily and they're in small chunks. Does that make sense? And I know Hannah is actually experiencing this now. And so I'm wondering what success strategies you're using, Hannah. Um, the reward system exact is, was exactly what I was going to suggest. Um, I um, set a timer for myself for tasks. Um, sometimes it helps if I turn my phone on airplane mode and just put a timer on so that I'm not distracted by social media or I've been into Angry Birds lately, so games or something, you know. <laughs> um, but I set a timer for like 45 minutes because I know that's how long my attention span lasts. Um, and if I can work on my homework or whatever I'm doing for 45 minutes, then I get to go stand out in the sunshine or I get to listen to one of my favorite songs, um, just little things like that, where I can kind of get my energy back and then refocus. Um, I think that's a really good idea. I also think that teachers, this is a whole new format for in-person teachers too. And they are open to suggestions on how to make classes more interesting as well at this point. Um, I know that in my classes, we've started integrating meditation or mindful moments or personal check-ins. Um, and that's really helped kind of just the energy of the class. Um, so maybe making a suggestion, if you have a suggestion for your teachers on something that would help you stay focused. Um, I think that they're being really receptive right now. Um, and then also one more thing is, so I'm not a technology person. Everyone in this Zoom session <laughs> knows it. Um, I struggle a lot. Um, but with the way the world is moving um, outside of this pandemic, you know, we're growing to become pretty technological. Um, I have taken this as an opportunity to kind of practice. I have presentations in some of my classes. Um, and I kind of take it as a practice for maybe online interviews in the future. Um, so kind of getting my skill set together, and that's my motivation of if I can if I can present on my online class and stay focused, then it's good practice for kind of career orientation or opportunities that may present themselves um, electronically in the future. And that's my. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anna. Those are really great tips. Um, one of the benefits of going to class physically is that you're not only learning the subject matter, but you're learning how to study. So the, the instructor, the professor is teaching you also how to study in addition to um, teaching the topic. So one of the things that is could be beneficial is learning what your learning style is. So there are three uh, main learning styles. There is um, the written word, verbal, and kinesthetic. So how do you learn the best? And there are online quizzes that you can just take for free 
And so based on what your result is, you could see what would be the most beneficial for you to focus on. Is it reading? Is it actually physically doing? Uh, is it listening to lectures? Um, so that is, that's what I would recommend. Thank you. Those were really good tips. Thank you. Okay, I've got two more questions. We'll see if we have time for both of them. We may not, but let's see. The next one says, my family is a little more on edge and not as patient with each other since the quarantine. It is strange that we seem less connected even though we are all home every day. Can you provide some fun and or practical ideas that I can introduce to keep the stress down and keep us all grounded? Thank you. So I can provide a practical idea. And this is from uh, growing up in a multi-generational household with four different generations, great grandparents, grandparents, parents, and me. And my great grandfather, they um, lived under communism for a while. And so my great grandparents and my grandmother who was a little girl at the time, they lived in a house that they owned. And all of a sudden, under communism, multiple other families moved into that house. So they were stuck in one room with other families in other rooms and they had to share their space. So my great grandfather would always say, maximum tolerance and minimal contact. That was his, um, that was his advice for the best way to live together. And similarly, my, my ancestors grew up, um, my grandpa and great grandpa were homesteaders in Eastern Montana. And they lived a whole family in a one room cabin that was uh, stuck together with basically mud and uh, grass on the roof. And I, and my dad came from a family of five and kids and, and grandparents and, and all were right in there. And so, um, and they went by the adage, which they didn't make up, but it was good fences make good neighbors. Um, and so I think you're right, creating some, some space and some, some ways to signal each other that you, you don't wanna talk right now. <laughs> and especially if you find yourself in an environment where you have more than one person who's trying to work or study, um, you know, it's all too easy to just bump into each other and start talking and the other person might be deep in thought about, you know, what they're thinking about. So having and using, again, a light touch and some humor with this, because I think laughter goes a long way to just um, rebalance our physical self and our mental self. So if there are things, you know, activities that you want to do together that can help you laugh and be creative together, I think that that's a really uh, good way to celebrate the, the togetherness. But then having really um, clear expectations of when it's time then to go to your separate corners or you know, wherever you're able to create distance as much as you can, I think that's a great, great idea. Um, and also just a recognition that everybody in your, your household is going through this differently than you are. And you brought that up in your question, so I give you a lot of, of credit for that and, and, and your intention of how do we make this the best that it can be. I think that's really, you're coming from such a great, your question comes from such a great place. So I think that you're already well ahead of, of most people in that regard. So um, kudos to you for that. And, you know, I think that also the creativity part is, you know, maybe thinking of together, you know, what could we make for dinner with what is in our pantry tonight? Or, um, you know, what kind of crafting could we do with what we have in this box? So accessing some creative and fun things that you can do together and knowing that you're making memories that are going to last you for a really long time. I'd like to just piggyback right, right off of what Terry just said, because I was going to offer some millennial tips. And one of those was exactly what, what you just talked about, which is the creativity piece. Um, 
you know, first establishing those boundaries. So my sister and I are on very different schedules uh, with our work. She works at night because her uh, job is basically in China. And so she is teaching her children at night and I'm working in the daytime. And so understanding that closed doors mean we need to be quiet and in separate spaces is really important during those times. Um, but we also have scheduled time together. So we plan times where we color together. Um, we'll say, okay, we're gonna take 30 minutes and we'll just read together in the living room. So that's our time. And then when that 30 minutes is up, we leave again and do our own thing. Um, we'll take walks together and then we'll come back and separate again. So just having those, those times where we're creative together is really fun and it's planned. So it's like at the end of the day, if we, we get tired of each other after that 30 minutes, then we're done with each other for the rest of the day and that's okay. Um, but also if you're working at home with a significant other a spouse, a family member, um, Dan and I were talking about the fake roommate tip. So, you know, the other thing is that we are also very different. And uh, I like to have the dishes this way and she likes to have, you know, the room this way. And so when we find things that are out of place, we blame it on someone who doesn't live here. So it's like, oh my gosh, Cindy left that coffee mug out again. I am so sick of Cindy. Like, why would she do that? And it helps to keep it lighthearted, but also be like, all right, now <laughs> that coffee mug needs to be put up. Um, so that's another tip is to use someone else as the person who you blame in this in this time in this situation. So I will just throw out there maybe um, enjoy the weather right now. We're so fortunate to have the weather that we do here. Um, this is that time of year and go outside for dinner and when you guys do reconvene and have a picnic dinner together just you know be outside in the space and you can still kind of do your own thing be in your own corner of your bl of the blanket you know but just enjoy the enjoy the outside together okay do we have time for the last question or do we it's uh, 12. Um, we'll try to get this one in real quick. I don't think it will take very long. Uh, I have noticed that my body is really antsy and uncomfortable, especially when I do a body scan meditation. What can I do to improve my meditation skills? So I'll go ahead, Nika. I was just going to quickly say that I can definitely relate to that and I find it really um, a lot easier to sit still once I've moved. So once I've done some yoga or even taken a walk or a little jog, then it's so much easier to sit still because my body has already, you know, felt physical exercise. So it's easier to keep still that way. Bless you, <laughs> bless you. Because. I have a sinus infection. It's not, I'm not really sick. It's just a sinus infection. So I love that tip. And I think um, another thing is just in the wording of your question is that it's okay to be where you are. Um, you don't have to get better at the body scan and you don't have to get better at meditation. And that's kind of nice, isn't it? You, there's no performance or outcome that you're, that you need to achieve with it. The fact that you're practicing is enough. And it's actually, you know, it's more than enough. You're putting effort uh, and into non-efforting, which is amazing. And so if you can allow yourself just a lot of gentleness and learning that, yeah, your body is anxious right now and just noticing that. And by the way, that, that jumpiness in your body is so, reflective of what we're living through right now. And so to expect it to be anything other than it is um, may not be realistic right now. And so again, just giving yourself a lot of credit for practicing. And then also know it's just kind of like yoga. Um, you know, if how you are today in a, in a posture or a pose or a meditation and a body scan, is going to be vastly different probably than it is tomorrow. And that 
that teaches us, that's a teacher for us to remember that things are not permanent. And so that jumpy feeling in your body, if you just notice what it's like today, tomorrow it might be that way, it might not be, but it gives you the chance to notice the changes that come and go in your body and know that changes come and go in our emotions, changes come and go in our thoughts, and that those feelings, physical or emotional, cognitive, don't define us. They move through us like weather. And so you don't have to be defined by that jumpiness. It's just that you have jumpiness in your body today. Um, I just want to jump in quickly and say I'm somebody who also, um, I have a lot of energy and sometimes stillness gives me anxiety. Um, and when I meditate, sometimes I like to just sway back and forth and kind of get into a rhythmic movement. So I'm moving, but I'm also, it's moving enough to where I'm not anxious about not moving, but I can also bring my focus back to whatever words are there because I'm not thinking about like my body isn't asking me to, to move, if that makes sense. So maybe finding little movements or twirling your fingers when you meditate little things like this can help us get that energy out, um, but won't be too um, distracting. Um, and also I like to say that um, the more we sit in discomfort, the more comfortable we become with it. <laughs> and so it's a practice, not a perfect. Um, and so the longer that we practice, um, and especially if we feel this discomfort, Maybe the next day you notice it's still uncomfortable, but it's a little less uncomfortable. Um, and we, we kind of get to that state until we can, we can sit with this so it's not so distracting anymore. But yeah, just practicing is enough. Thank you so much. I, I love just hearing the wisdom that comes from all of you. <laughs> I learn every time that I hear you, so thank you. So for those of you that joined us today, thank you so much. And um, just a reminder that if you'd like to join, subscribe to the YouTube channel, you can get alerts and keep up to date on, on what's going on. So until we meet again, have a fantastic weekend. Stay healthy, stay strong, stay safe, and stay connected. Bye-bye.